a lot of great inventions were initially brushed off, like the internet, the cheeseburger, and even the car, with the New York Times stating it was far too impractical to ever catch on. But there were believers, like Horatio Nelson Jackson, who made a $50 bet in 1903 that he could drive one all the way across America. It may have taken over two months, but with the help of a young mechanic and a trusty companion, the trio's accomplishment opened up a world of possibilities. Ever since, others have set out to best the record, and as cars got faster and roads got better, the previously arduous trek has evolved into a high-speed time trial, no longer taking months, but instead mere hours. This unsanctioned, highly illegal sprint is best known as the Cannonball Run, and with recent events, the record has been attacked and beaten the past few years more than ever before. This is a story of legality in Lamborghinis, of high risk in Hollywood, and of breaking rights and breaking records. This is the story of the Cannonball Run. After Horatio's run, it wasn't long before other teams made the trip. Actually, another team had already left before Horatio had even completed it, and arrived just a few weeks later, the first to steal the transcontinental record. Just a year after that, a small Franklin Roadster nearly cut the record in half, arriving in under 33 days. Then, two years later, the record was halved again, with one of the first six cylinders in America making the trip in 15 days, despite a couple collisions and Lester Whitman being arrested for speeding. To beat his own record, Whitman came back with a Rio 30 in 1910, and alternated drivers to go 24-7 and shave another four days off the record. And then, there was the namesake of the Cannonball Run himself, Erwin Cannonball Baker. Baker started off with dirt track motorcycle racing, but soon pivoted to endurance events, and found himself challenging trains from one city to another and taking on various journeys all across North America. In 1914, he made his first transcontinental run, and took the motorcycle record with a time of 11 and a half days. This was also the achievement that garnered him the name Cannonball, with a New York reporter likening him to the Cannonball Express train. But Irwin was just getting started. A year later, he went from Los Angeles to New York City in 11 days and 7 hours in a Stutz Bearcat, a new solo record. The next year, he did the trip in a Cadillac 8 Roadster, taking the outright record in under 7 and a half days. In 1924, he improved his record in the middle of winter, taking 4 days and 14 hours in a stock Gardner sedan which he liked so much he ended up buying. Baker went on to set 143 records, but the one most people remember was in 1933, when he drove from New York City to Los Angeles in a Graham Page Model 57 Blue Streak 8 in just 53 and a half hours. This run was on a completely different level. And even with cars getting faster, many people thought that the record would never be broken, and for a while it looked like they might be right. The automobile record stood for 10 years, 20, and then 30 years, before an unlikely competitor, a Sunbeam Imp costing less than $1,500, managed to make the journey in 48 hours and 9 minutes. This time stood for a few years, but Irwin's legacy was about to inspire a new event that would lead to more record attempts than ever before the Cannonball Baker Sea to Shining Sea Memorial Trophy Dash. The event was the brainchild of Brock Yates, who was working as a writer for Car and Driver magazine. Inspired by movies like Easy Rider, Vanishing Point, and Two Lane Blacktop, and emboldened by the fever of anti-establishmentarianism sweeping the world, he shared his vision with fellow co-workers and friends. Most brushed it off as childish and risky, but another former Car and Driver employee, Stephen Smith, thought it was great. The two were keen to put the improved interstate highway system to good use, with the eight suggesting that better drivers could safely drive well above the speed limit, and they wanted to prove it. Plus, they just wanted to have some fun. The plan was simple, clock out from the Red Ball Garage in New York, where the magazine housed their test fleet, and clock in at the Portofino Inn in Redondo Beach, California. Whoever got the fastest time would be the winner. To set them up for success, Yates managed to secure a loan from Dodge on a custom sportsman van powered by a 360 cubic inch V8 making 225 horsepower. They called the van Moon Trash 2, a nod to BF Moon Mullins, the public relations expert at Dodge who helped them get it. 
The Dodge was modified with the usual racing bits like bucket seats, mag wheels, tires and a tune, but also more unusual modifications, like a fridge. The only problem was, there was no one to compete against, as they couldn't find another team foolhardy enough to enter Yates's crazy event. He even had a hard time pulling together his own four-man team, and ended up recruiting his 14-year-old son, Brock Yates Jr., to help spot police. The team packed their unusual grocery list of goods and set out on May 23rd of 1971, with hopes of making the trip in under 40 hours. Along the way, Yates logged their entire transcontinental trip, noting abysmal gas mileage, high-speed vibrations, strong winds, and more, before finally clocking in at a disappointing 40 hours and 51 minutes. The first run of the event may not have cracked the 40-hour goal, but it was still a record and caught the eyes of many, including the so-called Polish Racing Drivers of America, or PRDA, who claimed that they would beat Yates and his team fair and square with some talented young drivers and a Chevy van loaded with so many gas tanks that they planned on making the entire trip without stopping once. But Yates was also upgrading, not the van, but to an entirely different echelon of vehicle. This time, he had gotten a Ferrari. The 4.4 liter 365 GTB4 was offered by Kirk White, who owned an exotic car dealership. Instead of Moontrash 2's 105 mile per hour top speed, the Ferrari was closer to 175 miles per hour and had a large gas tank, meaning it could go for over 300 miles at a time. The only downside to the Italian sports car was that it could only fit two drivers, meaning they wouldn't have as much time to rest between shifts. To find the best co-driver possible, Brock Yates began making phone calls to high pedigree drivers, but kept getting shut down again and again. While he wasn't having any luck finding his own co-driver, this second run of the Cannonball, just a few months later in November of 1971, was getting far more entries and ended up with a total of 8 teams. Still, the night before the event, Yates didn't have a co-pilot, but then he got a call. The call came from Dan Gurney a world-class driver and innovator who had initially rejected Brock's request before having a change of heart and packed only a shaving kit before hopping on a plane to make it just in time for the second run of the transcontinental race. The first to clock out and begin the race was the Polish team, as of course they had requested the quote-unquote pole position. The eight cars competing were quite a mix, with one team acquiring a Cadillac by acting as a delivery service, ensuring the client that they wouldn't drive very fast at all. Gurney and Yates took off in the Ferrari, which they felt was exceptional, explaining that due to the limits on American roads, the European cars were far better tuned for such high-speed driving. That said, these cars could have a bit too much personality at times, like when the windshield wipers stopped working. Still, with the car performing so well, they began to relax, at least until they saw another competitor at a gas station. It was the Cadillac that had left just 20 minutes before them. But how far ahead were the other competitors? The Ferrari was back to driving full tilt and making up time until it nearly crashed on Icy Bridge. Thankfully, Gurney was driving, and his incredible talent managed to prevent a disaster and keep the team moving along at a high speed, at least until they blew past a police car. They saw the officer pull out to chase them down, but ignored it and tried to escape. Unfortunately, there was an inspection station ahead, so they tried hiding at an empty gas station in the distance but it didn't work, and Gurney was given a $90 ticket. Even worse, they'd lost precious time. With their dreams of winning dashed, Gurney decided to push the Ferrari to the limit and see just how fast it could go, hitting 172 miles per hour as they traversed the desert into California. As they closed in on the Portofino Inn, three miles of traffic slowed them down before they finally arrived. Despite their run-in with the police, Gurney's mad dash had put them in front and they had set a new record of 35 hours and 54 minutes, and had won the second ever Cannonball Run. The other teams weren't far behind, and the PRDA claimed second, even though they did end up having to stop for fuel. Next was the delivery Cadillac, followed by another Dodge van with a big gas tank, and then two brothers in an AMX. Despite the diverse field of vehicles, the top five teams all finished within two hours of each other, as teams had to balance fuel capacity, economy, speed, handling, and cooling to try to find the perfect balance. Overall, the event was a success, and Yates felt vindicated in his theory that talented drivers should be able to drive faster. Their triumph worked to help spread their message, and with other publications echoing their words, people were keen for the third cannonball run. The third run was set a year later, on November 13th of 1972, 
and interest was high, with as many as 37 teams registered at one point. There was everything from a huge motorhome to a minuscule Honda 600, from Porsche 911s to a stretch limousine, from the Flying Fathers to the Wright Bra Racing Team. There were even filmmakers in attendance, who had signed a deal to make a Cannonball movie. For this year, Kirk White had sold the Ferrari, so Yates turned to Moon Mullins again, who set him up with a 340 cubic inch Challenger, which was modified for the event. Yates had asked both a friend and fellow editor if they could drive, as he expected one of them to bail. But instead, the three squeezed into the caged Challenger, which had no back seat. Once again, the PRDA started things off in pole position, this time in a V8 swapped Vega. As the team set out, rainstorms roared across the country and caught many teams, including Yates, who had gone way south in an attempt to avoid the storm. In the end, the record wasn't beaten this year, but it was a super close race, with the top three teams all within a 17 minute time frame. Yates didn't win this year, but a Cadillac Coupe de Ville, which had edged them out by 10 minutes with a time of 37.16. Apparently, the PRDA was on pace to crush the record, but the big engine managed to overpower the rear end somewhere in Arizona. The teams continued to trickle in, with the 26th and final finisher taking 57 hours after trying a northern route through the Rockies and getting stuck in deep snow. Word came that the Wright Bra racing team had been in an accident and had rolled the limo and broken the arm of one of the drivers. Luckily, everyone was okay, and overall the event was another success, but this would be the last one for a while. With both military and economic factors at play, Yates wrote that the notion of recreational driving for any reason became unpatriotic and put the cannonball run on hold. The movie had also died out, although the director would go on to work on Rocky instead. On January 2nd of 1974, a 55 mile per hour speed limit, otherwise known as the double nickel, was imposed across the country, aiming to reduce unnecessary fuel consumption. However, as 1975 came about, the conflict in Vietnam was wrapping up, and gasoline was becoming more plentiful again. Soon, many would rise up to fight against the double nickel, and what better way to do so than by bringing back the cannonball run. This year had 18 cars and 52 drivers turn up, with some serious competitors amongst them, with more Porsches and a Ferrari 246 GTS Dino. Yates brought out the Challenger again, this time with even more upgrades. For a co-driver, he recruited Steve Yogi Bear, who had been on the winning team in the last run. Unfortunately, this year they ran into some difficulty in Ohio, as they heard big rigs reporting them on the radio and the police responding, forcing the duo to hide out for a bit. Later on, they'd run into some dead-end shortcuts, and to top it off, they'd left the food they'd packed back in New York. After 38 hours and 3 minutes, they managed to check in, finishing in 3rd place. In 2nd place wasn't a Mercedes or one of the Porsches, but instead a 1973 Chevy pickup. The truck had a 454 and was driven by the extremely skillful stock racer Jack McCoy, who was accompanied by his wife, a close friend, and some extra fuel tanks. The winner of the 1975 run was the Ferrari, which had not only won the event, but had also managed to set a new record, eking out a victory over the run done by Yates and Gurney in their Ferrari by just one minute. Once again, the public was enamored, and Hollywood rushed to create a movie. Yates signed a deal with Paramount to write the screenplay for what they planned to call Coast to Coast. But others were racing them to the punch, like the Gumball Rally. However, it was a Hong Kong production company that was first, and released the movie Cannonball. Yates tried to stop Gumball Rally being made, but couldn't legally do so, and instead, Coast to Coast was cancelled. Yates was rightfully bitter about this, and refused to ever see Gumball Rally. To add insult to injury, Yates was having difficulties in his personal life, and was told that if he ran another Cannonball event, he'd be fired from his job at Car and Driver. Yates began to work a range of jobs, from novels to autobiographies, and eventually meeting Hal Needham. Yates described Needham as the bravest man he's ever met, which is saying something next to all the cannonballers over the years. Needham was one of the highest paid stuntmen around. He was the first to test the airbag, and broke 56 bones throughout his career. He eventually pivoted to directing and made Smokey and the Bandit, the second highest grossing film of 1977, only beaten out by the first ever Star Wars film. Through his friendship with Yates, Needham learned of the Cannonball Run, and suggested that they make a movie about it. Yates was against it, saying it had already been done by Cannonball and the Gumball Rally, but Needham declared, 
Hmm, we'll make a better one. And so the two began hatching their plan to do just that, which involved running a fifth and final cannonball run on April Fools, April 1st, 1979. Needham had the idea to drive a van disguised as an ambulance. So Yates once again turned to Moon Mullins, who set them up with a 383 Dodge van. For this final run, they went all out on the modifications, swapping in a 440 and painting a counterfeit Michigan registration sticker on the back. Yates and Needham would drive, with Brock's new wife, Pamela, pretending to be a senator's wife who was fighting a fictional lung ailment and had to be rushed to California to save her life. They loaded up on medical supplies and even convinced a real doctor to join them. At the starting line, they were met with 46 other teams and all new levels of creativity. One competitor had entered a Rolls Royce and hired a former Royal chauffeur to drive with a second support vehicle to follow them along. There was also a BMW motorcycle with a just married sign carrying two riders, one of which was sporting a blonde wig. There was also a Chevy Suburban done up like some sort of government satellite tracking vehicle with the warning sign to stay clear and drivers carrying around Geiger counters. And then there were just plain old fast cars and fast drivers, like a Ferrari SWB 250 GT driven by a future 12 hours of Sebring winner. Yates was getting nervous. Despite a new starting location, tons of people had found out about the event, and word was the police were setting up speed traps and roadblocks all over. To top it off, the van disguised as an ambulance was having troubles with the carburetor. Still, it was time to start, and as always, the PRDA got things rolling, this time in a white Z28. When the mechanic said the carburetor was good, Yates quickly took off, attempting to get out before more police caught on. Unfortunately, only 100 yards down the road, the ambulance rolled to a stop, still plagued with carburetor issues. An hour later, they finally left, but again ran into issues. This time, it was the police. The team sprung into their performance, but the cops countered with questions. If they had to take the patient all the way to California, why not fly? Yates suggested they talk to the doctor, who gave the performance of a lifetime, explaining her lungs couldn't handle the cabin pressure of a plane. Finally, the cops yielded. The disguise had worked, and the Transcon medevac was back on the road. They flew through Ohio, a state which claimed many competitors, including a black Ferrari Dino which was stopped three times within five miles of the state line. The ambulance was struggling again though, with the transmission failing to maintain high speeds and requiring constant fluid refills. This may have helped the team, as the fast competitors were being taken out one after the other, with around 30 arrests in Missouri. The radios were filled with warnings, one of which stated, If we catch that black Jaguar, we're going to put it in the crusher and its drivers in jail for life. Some drivers did spend some time locked away, while others were nearly run off the road by truckers. In Arizona, a super modified driver named Dennis Menasini found himself being chased down by some teenagers in a Chevelle. After a brake check, a thrown beer bottle, and a call to the cops, the engine blew in the Chevelle, and Dennis shoved a business card in the teen's mouth, accompanied by a stern warning. Despite all of this, Dennis would still somehow go on to finish fifth. Yates and the ambulance didn't do so well though, limping the van into California. At one point, they happened to come across a Kenworth truck, which offered to bring them the final leg of the journey. Upon arriving, they learned Dave Hines and Dave Yarbrough had won in a black Jaguar XJS, the car that had elicited the warning message on the radio back in Missouri. They had also managed to crack the record, with a time of just 32 hours and 51 minutes. Again, the race was close, and 8 minutes later, a 6.9 liter Mercedes rolled in with the team in tweed sports coats led by a Harvard professor. The final cannonball run was an astounding success in the eyes of Yates. They had raised $2,500 for a cancer fund and helped cement the idea that good drivers and good cars could safely drive well beyond the 55 mile per hour speed limit. In total, competitors across the runs had driven over 300,000 miles with an average speed of 76 miles per hour, and there had only been what Yates describes as two minor accidents. Even though the ambulance didn't pan out, the team partied for the next week and was filled with ideas to incorporate into Needham's movie, appropriately named The Cannonball Run. Originally, Steve McQueen was cast to star in the film, but was forced to resign due to his unfortunate battle with cancer. Instead, after a long search, Burt Reynolds, the star from Smokey and the Bandit, was cast for $5 million, a record-breaking amount at the time. 
Reynolds' ego had been boosted by his success, to the point where he didn't want to be in the film at all, but after a few flops, he took the opportunity. He wasn't a fan of the script Yates had come up with though, and wanted to cut out many of the real life events for more Hollywood flavor. No one was in a position to argue, and the story changed as more big stars were squeezed into cameos. Filming the movie went quickly. There was often no rehearsal and a bunch of one takes, with Reynolds in and out in just three weeks. When Yates first saw the film, he was devastated. This wasn't the story he had wanted to tell. Many critics felt the same, and the film was even nominated as one of the worst films of all time. But despite all of this, people watched it, and it was the second highest grossing film of 1981, and made tons of aftermarket revenue through toys, games, and other deals. It was lucrative enough to make a cannonball run too, and then Speed Zone, but Yates wasn't involved in either. He debated running another real cannonball run, but was discouraged by the amount of people who now had access to extremely fast cars, but lacked the skills to drive them at speed. Fearing a disaster and not wanting to hurt his case for allowing talented drivers to go beyond the speed limit, it was the end of the cannonball run, at least in that form. Even though the cannonball run had ended, there were still tons of people who wanted to challenge and beat the record. So the very next year, Rick Doherty put a small ad into Auto Week magazine to see if anyone wanted to join him in continuing the event under a different name, the US Express. The response was enormous, although this event had a different ethos, with drivers who weren't there for Hollywood fame or publicity, but instead came out to challenge the record. In 1980, Rick paired up with Will Wright, the video game designer who would go on to release The Sims and Spore. The two prepped Will's RX-7 with the usual goodies in a fridge, but also some new tech, like night vision scopes. They even had a radar gun pointing behind the car, the idea being that it would fool the detectors of other competitors and scare them into slowing down if they ever came close. But no one ever did. The US Express route was slightly longer than the original run, but the RX-7 did the trek in 33 hours and 39 minutes. It wasn't a new record, but it was enough to win the event. The following year, there was a snowstorm which closed a major route, but one competitor, a Porsche 928, was prepared with snow chains and was able to win the 1981 event. In 82, the cops had been tipped off and were prepared for the racers, even calling them by name as they pulled them over. Everything that could go wrong, did go wrong. 1983 was a similar affair, with cops quickly shutting down racers left and right. As a result of the police pressure, this would be the last US Express ever run, but against all odds, a flashy red Ferrari 308, driven by Doug Turner and David Diem, managed to sneak through the worst of it thanks to the help of a new tactic. They had a plane to spot for them. Some thought this was unfair, but there were no rules against it, and as a result, the Ferrari managed to make the trip in just 32 hours and 7 minutes, a new record in the final race across the country. With the Cannonball Run and US Express no more, many thought that the record would never be broken especially as time ticked by and roads became more crowded, while the police acquired better technology to quickly shut down anyone who dared make an attempt. For over 20 years, it really seemed like this would be the end of the story. But of course, some people still dreamed of being the record, and were working in the shadows towards their goal. Alex Roy, much like everyone else in the story, is a character, and so was his father, who had fought in the Second World War at 17 years old, was shot and wounded twice, spoke six languages, and had a love of cars, even attempting the cannonball himself, before his vehicle was apparently sabotaged. But he never told Alex any of this, as he didn't want his son spiraling into the same addiction that had once consumed him. It wasn't until his father was on his deathbed, suffering from cancer, that he opened the floodgates, and as expected, Alex began down the rabbit hole. With his foot in the door, he signed up for the 2003 Gumball 3000, a legal rally for the rich and famous. To get in, you usually had to buy a fancy car worthy of the event, but Alex didn't have the same resources. So, inspired by the cannonball stories of the past, he figured he could also use a disguise, like the ambulance Yates had used, but instead, he wanted to go as a police officer. He brought up the idea to his attorney, who quickly shot it down, but eventually yielded that it wouldn't technically be illegal if he went dressed as an officer from another country. And so, Alex decided to go as the German police, as he figured it might be a bit more believable speeding down the road, since Germany was of course home to the most famous No Limits Highway around, the Autobahn. For the car, he chose one built for the Autobahn, a BMW E39 M5. While searching for a co-pilot, one of his friends mentioned that her boyfriend was a great driver, and while Alex wasn't convinced, he decided to interview David Maher. 
He learned that Maher drove a Porsche 930, and seeing as he hadn't wrapped it around a tree yet, he figured he would do. As expected, the Gumball 3000 was jam-packed with expensive vehicles. There was a Porsche GT2, a Ferrari F50, and even a Koenigsegg. Dennis Collins was there with a 550 Marinello, and Richard Rawlings had brought a 4x4 Avalanche with all the gear, including a PlayStation. Once the rally began, it wasn't long before the detector started beeping, sirens started blaring, and competitors began getting picked off by the police. After a few checkpoints, it became clear who had come to win, and Alex was right up there with Rawlings in his Avalanche and Collins in his Ferrari. He was even gaining on them near the end, and speeding up to pass when the engine started to run out of fuel. Alex pulled over and asked for help on the CB radio, and Rawlings of all people, despite his competitive spirit, returned the call and let him know that he'd left a jerry can ahead at the next mile marker. For a legal event where drivers were supposed to abide by the law, there sure were a lot of crazy stories, some real and some which have been exaggerated over the years. One of these is the urban legend of the 242 mile per hour speeding ticket, supposedly the fastest in the world. While the car may have gotten close, and the driver claims that they hit 238 miles per hour before the speedometer stopped working, he also said that they slammed on the brakes when they saw the police, who clocked them at 127. The rumor continues that when they got the car out of the impound lot, the oil cap was missing, and they couldn't find a new one. So instead, they bought a brand new Volkswagen Beetle, just to salvage the oil cap, before leaving it and continuing on. Whether that happened or not, the car was again impounded in Florida, and didn't make it to the finish. While Alex Roy didn't win the gumball, he had found the closest thing that he could to the cannonball, and continued running gumballs, bull runs, and various rallies over the years dressed up as different police forces from around the world and in different countries all over, like an event in Morocco, where the king removed all speed limits for 48 hours. This was all great fun, although it didn't scratch his itch of challenging the cannonball record. But then, he came across a forum post which showed a trailer for an upcoming documentary, 32 hours, 7 minutes. 32 hours, 7 minutes was of course the cannonball record at the time, set by Doug and David back in 1983. But very few people knew of the record, not even Alex Roy. He had to know more and set up a meeting with the aspiring filmmaker, Corey Wells. She explained that her stepdad's friend was the record holder himself, Doug Turner. So she'd heard all of the stories and wanted to share their triumph. Alex was skeptical at first, but after seeing some of the footage, he was hooked and needed to see more. Corey was running out of money though. So to speed up production, Alex invested in the documentary trying to learn as much as he could about the fastest run to date. However, Richard Rawlings wanted to change that. Rawlings came to Alex with an executive from Spike TV and pitched that they race each other across the country while recording the action. But even Alex Roy wasn't crazy enough to join him for the project and said he'd only do it without any media attention. Needless to say, this wouldn't work for the future TV star. Alex called Corey, concerned that Rawlings might go ahead and break the record without him, which would detract from their own project. Was it finally time for Alex Roy to go for the record himself? The team poured over Corey's footage, trying to learn as much as possible. They estimated some numbers and projected that they could do a 3627, nowhere near enough. Gates himself didn't think it could be done in under 36 hours anymore either. Still, they decided to go on a bit of a test run, and despite some serious holdups, Alex and his friend John Goodrich, accompanied by Corey in the backseat, ran a 3446, faster than anyone had thought possible. Of course, this wasn't the end, and they promptly began working on their next run. Armed with more accurate data and new tools like Google Maps, Microsoft Excel, and Garmin GPS, Alex was locked in and would review all 34 hours of the footage in real time multiple times, looking for any way to improve. After countless hours of strategizing and trying to iron out any potential issues, the trio set out again, this time accompanied by a plane that was going to help spot for them. Unfortunately, after making it around halfway across the country in just 1451, the BMW M5, which had been bulletproof at events all around the world, finally let them down in Oklahoma. The fault was a $20 fuel filter. Goodrich had enough, but Corey and Alex already knew when the next window would be and began preparing. They added some new tech like a thermal scope and decided to pretend that they would be storm chasers to justify all of the gear. Alex also brought on a 21-year-old engineering student who was invaluable in preparing for the drive, JF. When it came time to find a co-pilot, it was difficult finding someone skilled enough who was also ready to accept the risk. In the end, it was Maher, Alex's partner in the 2003 Gumball who rose to the occasion, and on October 7, 2006, the reunited team set off at 9.26pm, with Corey in the backseat. JF started ahead of the M5 in an Audi A4 and relayed back updates. 
Once they got past him, he hopped on his computer and began tracking their ETA based on their GPS coordinates. Alex and Maher were near polar opposites. Alex was strategic and calculating, carefully tracking fuel consumption and their average speed. But Maher had other ideas and didn't care too much about the spreadsheets that had been painstakingly created. Instead, he emanated pure talent and figured driving faster could only help the cause. He constantly pushed the envelope, even when Alex tried to rein him in. Maher's high-speed, high-risk driving style meant that they quickly got ahead of schedule, although they were playing a dangerous game, narrowly avoiding police and with drivers calling in the speeding blue BMW. They were so far ahead that they almost missed their rendezvous with the spotting plane. Maher was flying and put in a double shift, zooming past where they'd broken down on the previous attempt. Thanks to his heroics, they were way ahead of the record, but they were going to need this advantage, as JF warned them of a storm ahead. On top of this, Maher's driving had drummed up a lot of attention, and they intercepted warning messages from truckers, letting cops know about the blue BMW covered in antennas. At this point, Alex had taken over, and police were all around. Soon, an officer spotted them and turned around to give chase. They had to act as cops were waiting ahead, so they tried to make some space before an exit. They got off, and the cop radioed in, oblivious that they had turned off. But then, they saw an ominous black and white car approaching, and Alex quickly shut down all their equipment and prepared to act out the Storm Chaser alibi. But it wasn't a cop car. Instead, a black and white Geek Squad Beetle. They were back in action, but the police were still waiting ahead. The scouting plane called in and began counting down the distance between the BMW and the police. Alex managed to find a transport truck to hide behind, and somehow snuck by two cops in the median. For once, Maher praised Alex's safer approach to driving. As the team entered the storm, fatigue began to set in. The thermal scope had stopped working, the car was running on fumes, cloud cover stopped the plane from giving updates, and worst of all, they'd fallen behind schedule, with an estimated time now too slow to beat the record. But once again, Maher was up, and again proved that you didn't always need high-tech or conservative strategies, but sometimes skillful aggression can work wonders. He averaged 96 miles per hour for the next 256 miles as the storm began to clear and wanted to push further still, but began to slow as fatigue and construction increased. Alex took over with just 131 miles left. This was it. This is what it was all for. The final miles were a hectic mess. A low gas light came on, and Corey yelled for them to slow down for a film production car waiting ahead, a Cayenne Turbo, but they blew right by it. Alex was breaking his own rules and driving dangerously. Finally though, they arrived and rushed out of the car to punch the time card. Everyone gathered around to see the result, and as they flipped it over, it read October 9th, 4.30 a.m. This translated to a time of 31 hours and 4 minutes. After more than two decades, the record had finally been broken. Once the smoke settled, the BMW was inspected and found to have cracked suspension and axles. Again, luck had been on Alex's side, and they had avoided another near disaster. So, what would the world think when they heard of their triumph? Well, it would be a while before the news broke. As to avoid being locked up, the team waited until they felt confident that the statute of limitations had expired, which in this case was a year. But before that time was up, someone else announced that they had beaten the record. Richard Rawlings. Many know Richard Rawlings from his hit TV show Fast and Loud, but he's had quite the life, from working as a cop and being shot in the arm, to starting his own shop, bar and grill, and all kinds of other ventures. Unlike Alex, who is calculating and methodical, Richard goes at things guns blazing, and his attempt at the run was no different. He was actually at the start of the 2007 Bull Run Rally in Montreal, when another competitor bet him $50,000 that he couldn't beat the cannonball record. So, Rawlings and Collins left immediately in the Ferrari 550, intent on beating the record and returning in time to rejoin the bull run before it had finished. They drove down to New York and hired a bunch of limousines to go ahead and see if any cops were around and make sure that they got the best start. After that, Richard and Dennis were on their own and managed to zoom across the country without running into the law. Thanks to added fuel capacity, they had only stopped four times for gas but they were about to run dry just a few miles from the finish. Thankfully, Richard had hired a trailer to take the car back across the country after, and had the driver grab just a splash of fuel to get them to the finish. In the end, Richard and Dennis clocked a time of 31 hours and 59 minutes, beating the cannonball record, but slower across the country than Alex Roy's unreleased time. Rawlings and Dennis hopped on a private jet to sleep while the Ferrari was driven back to the East Coast. 
Upon arrival, the same gentleman who had bet them $50,000 offered them double or nothing, with his bet being that both his team and their team would finish the race in first and second. Richard was intrigued and decided to take the bet. The next day, they followed him on what seemed like a slow route, until they arrived at a hangar where a DC-9 was waiting to carry the cars to the finish. Still, they had to make the lunch stop, so Richard and his new accomplice took helicopters and lied to competitors that their cars had run out of fuel and that their co-pilots were getting them sorted. Then, they hopped back into the copters and flew to the end, where they waited for the shocked and upset third place finisher to arrive. When Yates started the cannonball run, he said no rules, just punch the time card and go. However, over the years, as people have gotten more competitive and more creative, the rules have also been questioned more and more. When Alex Roy finally announced his record to the world, his incredible 3104, some people, like Rawlings, denied it, saying it wasn't a real cannonball record because he didn't start at the Red Ball Garage and didn't finish at the Portofino Inn. While true, Alex and Maher had still finished considerably faster than Rawlings and Collins and could have easily made up the discrepancy. Ironically, the cannonball record set by Richard's heroes Yarborough and Hines in 1979 also didn't start at the Red Ball Garage, but instead left from Connecticut. There were also issues surrounding the validity of the run. How did people know they'd actually done the run in the time they said? Apparently, one of the first record-breaking runs, way, way back, before the cannonball even started, was a 36-hour run by the basketball phenom Wilt Chamberlain. But Wilt was also rumored to have slept with over 20,000 women. Alex had video footage of his entire run and all kinds of receipts, but Richard didn't have anything that couldn't be forged, although he did get the 3159 tattooed on his arm. To make a point, Alex later announced that he'd beaten the record in a GTR-powered Infiniti Q50, equipped with two steering wheels and a smoke generator. He claimed he'd gotten police all across the country to help him, convincing them it'd be safer than trying to stop him. This meant a time of 26 hours and 28 minutes on April 1st. He later revealed this was an April Fool's joke, but a surprising amount of people believed the tale, and he proved how easy it is to place a story in major media outlets and have them distributed as fact. However, the next person to beat the record didn't want to leave anything up for debate. Ed Bullion fell in love with cars at a young age, consuming as much automotive content as he could while recovering from a rare knee disorder. While still in high school, he would call dealerships and explain to them that he was in the very lucrative business of breeding exotic reptiles and had money to burn on a new, equally exotic car. He managed to procure all kinds of test drives on his quest to discern what really was the best vehicle. And while 0-60's Nürburgring lap times and his own test drives were great, he figured that the ultimate test would be to drive a car across America. He shared the idea to his father, who told him that the cannonball was indeed a thing, now 30 years ago. Eager to learn more, Ed once again conjured up a tale to get an interview with Brock Yates himself. During the call, Ed fell in love with the idea of the cannonball run, and after a long chat, told Brock Yates that one day he would beat the record. To which Yates replied, good luck kid. Ed Bullion has a great book detailing what happened next, such as buying a Lamborghini at 20 and being over a million dollars in debt by 22. But for this story, we're going to fast forward to his attempt at the record run. For the trip, his co-pilot was Dave Black, a customer from a Lamborghini dealership Ed used to work at, and his friend Dan Huang also came along to help with navigation and spotting. They also had other friends and friends of friends scattered along the route to look out for police. Ed's run across the country was pretty smooth, not just because there weren't any runs with the cops or weather complications, but also literally thanks to the active suspension in the CL55 AMG, which was necessary to aid in supporting the 400 pounds of fuel the car had been modified to hold. They were doing so well that even with over a thousand miles left, they could have slowed to the speed limit and still beaten the record. But they didn't and kept pushing. With just a few hundred miles left, the team had a bit of a close call when a truck merged in front of them, forcing the CL55 to go two wheels off the road at over 100 miles per hour, but they managed to keep it together and finish the cannonball run in 28 hours and 50 minutes. To make sure there were no doubts, Ed had stuck to the original cannonball route, driving from the Red Ball Garage to the Portofino Inn. He also had paid for a GPS tracking firm to document his exact position and speed the entire run, resulting in a 282-page document. There were still some who questioned his run, shocked that they'd done it in a car that was limited to 156 miles per hour, or just unsure of the evidence. But most have come to accept the new record, which would hold for quite a while. Many teams were inspired by Ed's success and wanted to claim the record for their own. 
A few came close and shared the results, although many others made attempts which never saw the light of day. Arnie Toman and Doug Talbot had been thinking about taking a stab at the run for a while, and decided that it would be best if they teamed up, both focusing on their individual strengths. Arnie had co-founded AMS Performance, and was primarily in charge of prepping the car, a 2015 E63 AMG, which they dubbed Angry Ursula. He added a performance kit carried by AMS, then actually detuned the car to around 700 horsepower. In addition to the usual scanners and jammers, they fitted a thermal scope on the roof, which could be remotely controlled by the passenger in the back seat. To make the car less conspicuous, Arnie took off the badges and hid away any traces of carbon fiber or anything exotic, in an attempt to make the car look like your average sedan. He even masked off part of the taillights, which kind of made the AMG look like a 2000s Accord from the back. Doug was the founder of Switch Cars, and focused on the logistics and strategy of the run, choosing to run at a faster speed, but with four gas stops. Finally, they recruited Berkeley Chadwick to spot. Along the run, they ran into all kinds of technical issues, with their thermal scope, scanner, and CB radio. At one point, somewhere in the Rocky Mountains, the car died altogether, and as they coasted to a stop, they began sending the text out to let everyone know that it was over. But then they cranked the engine and took off again. The car had died as a result of the 91 octane they'd last filled up with, which upset the engine which had been tuned for 93. The altitude may have played a part in this as well. Another issue they ran into was Arnie spilling fuel all over his foot at the first stop, but thankfully, of all things to pack, Doug just so happened to have a spare pair of shoes. They had a few close calls, including a cop who kept an eye on them for about 20 minutes, but the rest of the run flew by thanks to the enormous efforts of spotters scattered throughout the country. Both drivers had done an incredible job convincing people that they knew to come out and help give their run the edge needed to beat the record. They even had Kyle Loftus of 1320 Video helping them find people to join in. In total, they had around 18 spotters, and these weren't just ordinary cars meandering ahead, but instead, many of the spotters really got into the spirit and were also decked out with the usual cannonball paraphernalia. All the spotters were in a group chat, which caused a bit of competition, with drivers trying to stay ahead and clear a route for the team for as long as possible. One spotter even got pulled over at 130 miles per hour, just in preparation for the run, but somehow talked himself out of the ticket by convincing the officer that the car was acting up. They had people everywhere, and even had someone waiting at one of the gas stations with a pumped primed and ready to go in each hand. For the final leg, they had a rider in a motorcycle lead the way. This wasn't just anyone though, but Carl Reese, who at one point held the cannonball record on a motorcycle, a 3849. Carl was driving ahead of the team, trying to flash his lights at drivers to clear the left lane. The team was so far ahead that they didn't need any miracles, nor did they need to push. But they wanted the run to be dominant, and they didn't want to do it ever again. And so, they broke the record by a huge margin, slicing off 1 hour and 25 minutes for a time of 27.25. When the news broke, everyone praised the incredible run, and their ability to do so relatively safely, thanks to so many people helping them with the achievement. However, the next team which challenged the record wouldn't receive the same praise, and instead were criticized, with some saying their attempt shouldn't count at all. This was the run of Captain Chaos. In the original Cannonball Run film, Captain Chaos is the comical alter ego of one of the runners. This character was partly inspired by an actual participant from a real Cannonball Run, Bill Warner, who drove a 911 in the 1975 event and went by the nickname given to him during his time in the Air Force, Captain Marvel. In 2020 though, Captain Chaos was the moniker used by a team which chose to remain anonymous. Apparently, this team didn't have tons of help, groundbreaking technology, or a crazy hypercar. But there was one major advantage that no other record breaker in the past had access to, a pandemic. With the Americans being asked to stay at home and officers busy elsewhere, the roads were more open than they'd been in decades, and the team managed to sail across the country in their Audi A8, taking just 26 hours and 38 minutes. A lot of people weren't happy about the opportunistic run and condemned the attempt. But the cross-country drive isn't an official, sanctioned activity, and whether people liked it or not, whether it was more dangerous or irresponsible than prior runs, the record had been broken. In an interview, Ed Bullion said that while he didn't think it was the best use of time while the country was staying in, for him to say it was awful would be like a cocaine dealer saying that a heroin dealer is a terrible person. In the end, any attempt at the record is highly illegal and has potential to cause harm. So while this attempt may have been even more dangerous than prior ones, it couldn't be denied. 
Arnie and Doug wanted to take back their record, but angry Ursula was in no shape to run. Just 12 hours before the record was broken, Arnie was helping scout for some other teams and pulled over to record a video of them as they were driving by. Then, a drowsy trucker veered into the record-breaking car and totaled it. They scrambled to find a way to challenge the record again as the country was beginning to open up and they only had a small window. At first, Doug bought a Corvette which had already been modified and had already run a 2948. But they weren't thrilled with the car and instead opted for a modified Audi S6. With time running out, the team worked around the clock to get the car at least somewhat ready to make a record attempt. While salvaging the usual necessities from other cannonball cars, they also made clever use of masking, paint, and a custom badge to make the car look eerily similar to a Ford Taurus police car. They found a spotter, and it was time to go. Unfortunately, the lack of testing really slowed the car down, as it made a whistling sound at above 160 miles per hour, which was so annoying that the team elected to stay just under for most of the trip. They also found that the car didn't accelerate, brake, or handle as well as their totaled Mercedes. Things weren't looking good, and at one point, they thought it was over altogether, when Doug explained that the car was swerving like it had a mind of its own and didn't feel safe at all. He was about to pull over to check when Arnie woke up from the back seat and noticed the cause of the problem. Lane Assist had been engaged. Problems continued to emerge, and some miscommunication at a gas station meant that the car wasn't fully filled and that they'd have to make five stops total. Then there was heavy traffic, and then, possibly worst of all, a keen trucker radioed to the police that there was a white Audi made to look like a police car speeding by. An officer responded and said he was waiting up ahead. The team had been using scouts to distract officers and would pay for their tickets, but that wouldn't work this time. But then they noticed the officer was too slow setting up and was actually waiting behind them. And so they stepped on it, getting as far away as possible. On their first run, they knew they'd beaten the record and could coast through California. But in quarantine, there were all kinds of super fast record attempts, five of which were already faster than their last one, so they didn't have the luxury to slow down. It was now the afternoon though, and they had to wait for red lights and dense traffic until they finally clocked in. The time was 25.39, nearly an hour faster than the anonymous run, even with the lack of testing and holdups. They had also made the run just in time, as traffic was beginning to return to normal. As a result, many have called the record unbeatable, and so far it has been, still standing today. Some feel that these quarantine records should have an asterisk beside them, as they were done on a different playing field and that there's no competing against them. But that's also been said in the past, and just like before, people will continue to study and try to find new ways to challenge the record. In the meantime, some competitors have turned their focus to other records, like the diesel record, a 2830, the electric record, a 4217, or the motorcycle record, currently a 3252. Alex Roy was on a team that set the autonomous record, using Tesla's autopilot 97.7% of the way to complete a 55 hour run in 2016. Some even shoot for the coast to coast to coast record, making the trip and then coming back again, with a Mercedes S500 currently holding the record at 6519. While the Cannonball Run was last officially run in 1979, in 1984, Yates launched a more legal event, best known as the One Lap of America. Originally, the event was a 9,000 mile race around the country that was supposed to be more of a rally, but it was fraught with issues, including a ramp that cars couldn't get up because it was too slippery after a jello wrestling performance. This event has been heavily modified over the years and is still run to this day, with competitors abiding to the rules of the road and saving the high speed for track stops scattered throughout the route. The spirit of the Cannonball Run has also inspired similar competitions all around the globe, and has lived on for decades now. Some have been successful, while others have ended in tragedy. There's even been TV shows, which have tried to profit on a piece of the magic and challenge that has captured the hearts and ambitions of so many enthusiasts over the years. The stories in this video barely scratch the surface, and if you'd like to learn more, there's all kinds of incredible content out there. If you enjoy reading, there's Cannonball, written by Brock Yates himself, along with Alex Roy's book and Ed Bullion's. If you prefer documentaries, there's Corey Wells' 32 Hours 7 Minutes and Apex, The Secret Race Across America. Of course, there are tons of movies inspired by the original race as well. Trying to cram all of this into one video took way longer than I expected, but I hope you enjoyed the first story on American soil. Thank you so much for watching and supporting the channel. Seeing the comments, likes, and everything really helps push me through these lengthy videos. 
If you have any suggestions for a future video, such as a new story or even a whole different format, like maybe an interview with someone, I'm always looking for new ideas. Finally, don't attempt this, or anything illegal or dangerous to yourself or others. Anyways, thank you again so much for watching, and I hope you have a great day.